Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion on how to avoid getting left behind in a data-driven future. Uh, today, I hope we can shed some light on the key types of data needed to stay ahead, how to use data to get and keep customers engaged, and what technologies we need to be thinking about to collect and use that data. Um, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to allow each panelist to introduce themselves. Uh, Jeffrey, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Thank you. Uh, I'm Jeffrey, a Chief Scientific Officer at Founders Factory. So we are both a startup studio and also accelerator, meaning we build companies from scratch and uh, we invest in others. And we have you know, a retail sector and AI sector, which I think could be very interesting for this discussion. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Josh, how about you introduce yourself next? Sure, uh, Josh Balin. I'm the Senior Director of uh, Strategy and Analytics at BrainCorp. Uh, for those that don't know, BrainCorp is an AI company uh, that creates uh, transformative uh, technology uh, called BrainOS. BrainOS helps us autonomously manage uh, robot fleets, autonomous uh, mobile robots. Uh, as of right now, uh, between us and our partners, uh, we've uh, built, deployed, and serviced more than 11,000 robots globally. Uh, and um, yeah, I, uh, right now we're in retail environments, grocery, uh, malls and airports, so I'm hoping that uh, some of our uh, robotics expertise uh, and experience will, uh, will lend itself well to this conversation. Thanks, Josh. Uh, our third panelist is Akash. Akash, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Akash Jareth, I'm the Chief Data Officer for uh, the Dentsu uh, Aegis Network media line of business here in the U.S and really focused on leveraging um, proprietary data, partnership data to, to generate scalable automated solutions, um, which uh, obviously involves um, AI ML where, where, where leverageable for efficiency, for intelligence, uh, et cetera. Thanks, Akash. Um, and I'll finish up by introducing myself. My name is Tyne Hines and I'll be your moderator for this event. Uh, I'm a senior product manager uh, of data and machine learning at Zulily. Uh, which is an online retail site in the United States. Um, and I have over 10 years experience in online retail. I'm super excited to hear what the panelists have to say on this topic. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so for the first question, I wanted to start talking out about how data plays into staying ahead in retail. Uh, what data should companies be thinking about capturing or creating for the future? Um, Jeffrey, let's start with you. What do you have uh, thoughts on this one? Sure. And I guess it also depends what kind of business you are. So are you a pure uh, online business, so e-commerce site um, having lots of online traffic or whether you have, uh, you know, brick and mortar stores, uh, stores as well? Um, I think in the first case, uh, in the online world, we're used to have, you know, lots of demographics data about, you know, about the customer, where they come from, where they live, you know, what time, what, what habits do they have, what are their interests? Um, and there's lots as well that you can do to connect to their social media profiles, to know what they're interested in, where they go on holidays, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that's uh, huge data uh, feeds that um, companies can tap into to, to better understand their, their customers. But I guess there are also the, the real world where there are still, you know, still pre-COVID, about 80% of the world's you know, uh, commerce is still being done in the real world. So there's lots of transactions happening. So I think there are new strategies to kind of bridge the gap between online and offline. So how can you connect somebody who's going to a store with you know, all the data that we have about them in the online world? Uh, there's lots of technologies happening there, not just from you know, apps, you know, getting data from users, but also from um, uh, devices that can actually track users as they come in and connect the two. Um, I think that's a very exciting space. And I guess, you know, there are uh, lots of other data that I guess the, the rest of the panel can, can add to, but I think there's, there's another point as well, which is e even for um, online sites, the number of site visitors that actually sign in and authenticate are actually in the low, you know, single digits of percentage. So how can you, how can you know customers that are anonymous? I think that's a new field that is coming up. So based on just, you know, where they're coming from, what was the site that referred them, you know, to your site, and also based on the little bit of behavior that you can see uh, how they interact, 
how can you infer intent? And I think that's a very promising area. That's so interesting. Um, we definitely focus a bit on that as well at Zulily, um, really looking at behavioral data. And I think we kind of are, are looking at the same things and trying to figure out if we don't have a lot of information about a particular customer, how do we predict what they want? Um, it's really, really interesting. For us, we focus a lot on trying to provide data about products themselves, uh, you know, like what color something is, what price point it is, how true it is to size. Um, so we have a huge focus right now on getting more of that data, um, both by making it easier for vendors to upload it um, and using machine learning techniques, of course, uh, to extract product information from text or images. Um, but when we move to the customer side, that is really interesting. We, we also do a lot of kind of tracking what our customers are doing, where they're coming from, uh, what their preferences are, so that we can kind of match what we have um, based on their preferences to the products that we have. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very interesting stuff, but we definitely run into that challenge of, you know, how much do you know about that, that uh, person coming in? And if they haven't authenticated, if they're not a member of the site, how do you predict what's going to be interesting to them? So that, that's, that's really interesting stuff to talk about. Um, so Josh, do you have any uh, thoughts about this as well? Sure. So uh, in some ways, uh, the robots that we have are really perfect uh, devices for uh, capturing data, right? They, in some ways, they're almost a perfect IoT uh, uh, device in these environments, right? And so I think a lot of folks have been focused on, you know, what types of data the robots can collect for inventory analytics or maybe shelf conditions, maybe even planogram compliance. But I think even taking a step back from that, what our robots really allow uh, our customers and partners to do for the first time is to really get proof of work uh, and operational efficiencies that they may not have had before. You know, let me see if I can pull something up. Uh, in this particular case, while the robot is actually running, um, you can see for the first time, we're actually tracking where uh, the clean is happening, right? So ideas like cleaning compliance and actually sort of uh, enhancing uh, the productivity of, of uh, custodial or janitorial workers in that environment, right? And sort of getting that operational efficiency through data is something where we've actually found our customers are, are quite happy. Um, I think we may sort of come back later in the discussion to sort of some, some different, more innovative or uh, alternative ways that, that the robots can collect data. But again, at the core, its core function of either cleaning or delivering is actually um, you know, more data than folks have had with these particular tasks inside these environments previously. I love that. Uh, you know, I think it's a good um, reminder that our customers are, are really varied uh, and that we have to really um, think about their needs and, and try and figure out how to provide the information to them. And that's just such a wonderful way. Um, Akash, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, you know, a couple of things that um, contextualize what, what's happening right now. I think one, the, um, with, with COVID, the, the jolt that was given to the digitization of, of interaction, of commerce, of transactions, I think things that would have happened over five, seven, 10 years have happened in the course of six months. So commerce has become um, so much more um, uh, digitized. Uh, uh, interaction and experience has become digitized. Social interactions have become digitized. So I think that's one big transformation. Uh, the second is the advent of, of privacy. And so uh, privacy laws across, uh, across the world. And so that in, in a sense prevents um, um, abuse of collection of consumer data, but also I think allows um, the, or puts the problem of the value exchange front and center for when a consumer is coming, um, whether it's to a store, whether it's a, a brick and mortar store, a, a digital store, um, or really any publisher content, they're, they're able to say, look, I'm, I can provide my identity, I can log in if you provide me some value. And a publisher can say, look, I I, I need to get my value. If you're not going to pay me, I need to be able to generate revenue. So please give me your, your uh, identity. And consumers can say, look, this interaction, I don't mind it being tracked. Other interaction, I would rather keep private. They have more, more control, I think. But, but that, that, that's becoming very um, open in terms of what is and isn't uh, being connected. And so I think the challenge we have right now with sort of offline and, and sort of real people, quote unquote, versus sort of digital identities, I think that bridge is going to happen naturally. It would have taken, I think, much longer, but 
uh, you know, what, what these privacy laws announcements from the likes of Google and Apple, um, along with COVID has done is accelerated some of these things. So I think the last six months, there's been a lot of sort of change of dynamics. Um, and I think the next six to 12 months, we're going to see sort of the, the, uh, the impact of that and, and actually see a much more um, uh, identity aware, logged in a presence online. Um, you know, Amazon already has stores where they're, you know, you, you walk in, you know, you don't do anything, you pick up what you need and you walk out. I think we'll see, we'll see more of that. So um, it, it's going to be more about the consumer experience and less about specific transactions. So it'll really permeate um, everything, whether it's uh, physical or, or digital. Yeah, that's such a good point. Um, and I love that kind of uh, point that COVID-19 has certainly changed the way that we've done and we're doing business and accelerated some of the trends um, and, and also the highlight of all the privacy laws that, that people have been dealing with and how now that so much more is online, we have to really think thoughtfully about how we're managing that data. Um, let's kind of shift a little bit. We talked a lot about kind of customers once we've already gotten them in our ecosystem or clients once we've sort of already um, I've gotten them, but how do we engage our customers and our clients? And, and then once we've sort of gotten them to, to our site, how do we um, keep them there? Um, Akash, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is in sort of an extension of, of what I was saying uh, that it's all about the consumer experience, right? And so when, when, they're, when they're coming and engaging with you before they're actually a customer and, and they're a prospect customer, um, I think businesses are going to try and find new ways of um, engaging with them where things are made relevant to them, things are customized to them. Um, this includes, you know, what you mentioned, I think earlier that, you know, you're looking at, at colors and price points, um, there's behavioral information. So I think as much as possible, the, the brands, especially ones that don't have a direct consumer relationship, are going to want to have that direct consumer relationship. Um, CPG brands, big mass, uh, mass level retail brands. So I think that's going to change the nature uh, to some extent. Digitization helps, but in general, it's going to be about um, letting the consumer uh, feeling, giving the consumer control of, of how much they're willing to share and giving them that personalization uh, from that. Uh, which helps the consumer and makes them feel like uh, they're getting more value and then obviously helps the brand by getting better understanding, whether it's understanding at an individual level and therefore responding at an individual level or better understanding at a behavioral level, understanding that, you know, a certain messaging in a certain context works better or, um, you know, certain um, shopping carts, different items go together, like whatever that interaction is. But it's all about, I think, building that relationship uh, really before they become a consumer. Um, and so your, you know, I think CRM databases used to be kind of um, really your customers in a subset, uh, almost think of the, the general population as your, as your CRM database um, and, and see how far down the funnel you can get them. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really fun to try and figure all that out. Um, Jeffrey, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yes, and I guess in terms of using data to engage, you know, all the customers you have on your CRM is, is a great idea. I think some, some of the bad experiences we've all had is like when you go onto a certain site and maybe you're browsing, you know, big screen TVs, and then all of a sudden, you know, big screen TVs follow you all across the internet. Everywhere you go on your browser, you get the same ads. So I, I guess there are certain technologies that are coming in together. I, I talked, you know, before about intent. So I think as long as you know the customer is interested, is really interested at this point in time in this product, I think it's fine to go and remind them and kind of excite them and bring them on a journey of discovery about this product. But I think also there are certain advances, you know, based on the data that you have already about the browsing habits and, you know, the, the abandoned purchase in cards, etc. How do you personalize that touch point with the customer when you're reaching out, whether it's through an ad, whether it's through, through a text message or whether it's through WhatsApp, uh, or even in, in an email, I think it's where synthetic media can really come in because there are lots of companies out there who can craft, you know, customized text to kind of draw, you know, so it's not a, an overt sell of the product, but it's more about, you know, informing the customer about certain benefits of the product or how it could be used. So it could, I think that happens both in text, in, in your emails um, and, and in your social media, but it's also in images. Because now with the GANs and all these technologies, we can create you know, new images of people, but also of products. 
So I guess, you know, it's really exciting, not just on how we infer the intent, but how do we, you know, touch the lives of customers and make them inspired to come back again and, and be engaged and interact with, with your, you know, online real estate. I, I love that. It sounds like uh, both of you are talking about kind of focusing a bit on personalization, um, but also trying to find ways to really uh, delight the customer. And I think we see the same thing at Zulily, uh, where we're focusing a lot on, on trying to use personalization where it's uh, really uh, valuable. Um, so we do spend a lot of time uh, tailoring our messages to either small groups of customers or when possible, right, directly to the individual themselves. Um, and, and that way we can really get a sense of, of what they really like uh, and make sure that we keep showing them those kinds of things um, while also providing them a little bit of kind of interesting stuff um, that, that maybe they weren't directly looking for when they came to the site, but, but might, might interest them a little bit. So trying to find not only the exact thing that they're looking for, but maybe something just on the side. I think for retail, that's like a really exciting trend is to, to not just fulfill the exact need, but also show them a little bit more. Um, it's a bit like when you go window shopping and you might be going to buy a particular t-shirt or a pair of pants and then you go and you see see something else that sort of sparks your interest and I think that's where kind of having this personalization we can sort of predict that kind of stuff and 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 help fulfill that need um, yeah I, Josh do you have oh sorry go ahead Akash sorry quick, very quick quickly um, I, I think that's a really good point and I think you know when um, earlier on advertising were, was mostly um, context-based, right? You're, you're putting the right messages in the right kind of magazines, or you're putting the right ad in the right TV audience. Um, and then we had sort of this audience-centric phase for quite a while, addressability. And um, I think, you know, we kind of shifted from one to the other to some extent. Uh, but now with, and, you know, to, to Josh's point from earlier, now with the, the availability of such vast amounts of data and, you know, AI being, um, you know, progressing the way it is, the idea is to very much sort of make those decisions in the moment, use the context, you know, use other behavior, use the audience information that you have, um, and not separating an audience versus context, but making it part of one thing, uh, I think is really kind of the next phase. So true, so true. Um, so we've been focusing very heavily on retail, but um, you know, Josh, you don't exactly have that direct kind of online retail model. I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, how you are engaging your customers and sort of keeping them interested with the data uh, that you have. Oh, I think you're muted. I wanted to actually show uh, one of our robots inside a, a retail environment, right? So uh, some of the folks out there can get a sense for just how much data is actually present inside these environments, right? And so as the robot is going up and down aisles, uh, we're obviously being exposed to uh, different products and brands and shelf conditions and things like that. And all of that stuff is, is again, very valuable uh, knowledge for the retailers themselves. But in some ways, and I actually want to go back to, you know, some of the personalization that you're talking about, and it's fitted a little bit differently. What AMRs and specifically what our AMRs have really allowed our customers to do, right, which are, um, you know, the big retailers and such, is provide an environment that they are uh, proud of and, and that make their customers feel comfortable shopping in, right? And so in this COVID environment, um, you know, there are lots of folks that obviously went online and then omnichannel retail obviously becomes a huge priority for the retailers themselves. And so now by keeping environments clean, by optimizing different workflows, perhaps than we've had previously, when the end customer walks into uh, a Walmart or a Kroger and notices, wow, the floors here are really clean or the shelves are really stocked well, that actually improves the shopping experience quite a bit and can lead to things like sales lift and even some of the recommendations that you all are alluding to th from some different AI or ML. And so, you know, what may get often overlooked uh, as, as something that's critical is actually providing sort of a fundamental baseline so that uh, some of the techniques um, and sort of more advanced uh, 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 data um, strategies can, can really be utilized. Um, so, so I think it's important to note that. And one other thing, you know, we actually noticed a huge increase. Like during COVID, we saw nearly a 25% year over year increase in uh, robot usage, right? And in part, that's because 
um, different janitorial staff or custodians were focused on cleaning different areas of the store while the robot was operating autonomously, right? So what had once been sort of a, a two or three hour task for uh, you know, a janitor in the store, that productivity uh, can now be freed up by the robot and uh, more high value clean can be sort of applied in high traffic areas like handles on doors or even in checkout areas. And so this is something where it doesn't quite sound like personalization, but it really is. I love it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more um, about some of the technologies. Josh, you alluded a little bit to this with, with the robots here, um, but we've, we've focused a lot on data so far. What are some of the new technologies that we really wanna be looking to to help us uh, really advance, the, th the real cutting edge things? Josh, I'll go ahead and let you start. Certainly uh, lots of folks in retail environments are extremely focused on computer vision, right? And the different types of applications that computer vision can unlock. Um, I would sort of caution folks that before we can start using computer vision at scale, uh, really the collection and preparation of that data becomes even more critical, right? And so different types of collection mechanisms are, are quite important. We obviously have robots that you know, go around and collect data. There are some retailers using fixed shelf cameras uh, for high velocity items, right? Um, to ensure, you know, healthy shelf conditions on things that are out, like everybody I think experienced with toilet paper or bleach uh, early on in the pandemic. Um, they're even using sort of uh, cameras that are mounted, um, you know, in aisles to, to unlock sort of different types of capture, um, data capture methods. Um, I think, you know, advances, uh, and I hope you all would agree with me, but I think advances in, in labeling uh, will go a long way to unlocking some more applications in these environments. And, and, and frankly, you know, and, and I think Akash noted this earlier, some of the privatization and privacy concerns are actually quite important in these environments, right? Whether we're talking about human obfuscation or uh, basically uh, segmenting different data between different departments, um, th this type of data management is going to be quite important over time as different types of applications, uh, you know, sort of get launched. Um, one other thing I would note is beyond computer vision, uh, we've got lots of different sensors that can be added to collect different data, you know, a bit more passively, right? Originally, I think folks thought of IoT or smart buildings or things like that. But, but now, whether you're on a mobile platform like our AMRs or you're in a fixed environment, you can be collecting things like temperature or humidity or lights, right? Identifying lights that may be out in different locations. And so all of these different workflow optimization improvements are gonna be present uh, in the coming years for sure. Akash, how about you? What, do you uh, what are technologies that you're kind of looking at to help you stay really cutting edge? Um, I think, um, you know, one for us, a large part of it um, is, is digital, um, but really outside of that is mobile. And by mobile, I don't necessarily mean what's happening on your mobile devices and your phone, but being location aware. Um, and so, you know, to Josh's point about temperature, uh, et cetera, I think, you know, what, how people are engaging with the physical world um, is, is critical. And as much of that information as we can get. Um, it, is, it is cutting edge in that it's not something traditionally that's been then tied into uh, an individual or a cohort or a segment necessarily. So I think that type of technology and where that's, that's being able to connect more with the rest of the ecosystem is really what we're curious about because that's, that's what's so different from what has been. I think in terms of when you're at home, you're on your computer, you know, if you're, if you're sitting at a coffee shop and you're on your phone or tablet, you're on an ecosystem that we understand and we're kind of familiar with the engagement identification. It's outside of that that I think is critical. So the more that our sensors, the more that our um, engagements, the more there's augmentation of your context, physical context, I think that's going to be the key to sort of what's coming up next. And Jeffrey, uh, how about you? What are your uh, technologies that you're really excited about for the future? Um, I agree with the panel. I think there's lots of technologies and uh, technologies on the front end, so you know, facing the customer. But I think on the back end as well, in the back office, there's lots of um, new advancements that can actually, you know, improve the experience of the of the customer and and, and the user. 
um, namely, you know, Josh has been talking about computer vision. There are new technologies, one of the companies in our portfolio called Emotive can take a picture of any product and then, you know, talk really well about the, um, you know, the, the good qualities of the product. So, you know, given a picture of a, of, of a lace, of a black dress, it can say it's a beautiful black lace dress that can be worn in the evenings and put that in, into context. So I guess there are lots of technologies that are, you know, turning the dry content in lots of you know, online sites and making that you know, more inspiring um, and more engaging for the customer that you know, can eventually lead them to, to, to a purchase. So I think both on the textual side, on the metadata side, because we know that retailers actually spend you know, uh, a lot of money actually, especially those with, with turning inventory that change with fashion, you know, especially fast fashion, they have to spend you know, a, a, a lot of money into like, keeping their databases up to date with any change of season, they have to make sure all their data attributes are, are correct. And I guess technologies like that working both across the text and the images can actually make that job easier and also inspire the customer. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think what's really interesting for me is uh, I'm excited about the fact that there are these large kind of projects to, to take a lot of um, information and use that to extract information from images or from text. Uh, in, in really interesting ways. And I think for somebody like Zulily, that's just really wonderful because to your point, Jeffrey, we have a very, um, our inventory turns over quite regularly. We're sort of a flash sale model. And so it is such a challenge for us to, to keep up in terms of providing all that really robust product information, but do it in a way that's not asking our vendors to, um, you know, provide a really heavy lift um, and not having a huge team of people sort of manually curating that information. Uh, so for me, I think the technology that's really exciting to me are, are these efforts to, to really try and extract things like color or pattern, or you had talked about lace to really get some of that more information about products. Um, and I think that that's just really exciting to see in the future. Um, uh, any other final thoughts on this one? The only thing I would add, and I, I zipped a, a little map up here because I think it's it's super relevant to some of these computer vision applications, but what you're looking at here is actually a robot that's taking pictures up and down different aisles, right? And by being able to locate exactly where pictures were taken and sort of stitch those images together in a way, uh, you know, really previously that, that hadn't been, you know, it really hadn't been done before. Um, it really allows us some new ways to provide insights in these uh, in these interior maps, right? So we all know quite a bit about exterior mapping and the possibilities of GPS, but when you come inside an environment, the ability to do geolocation changes quite a bit. And so this is something where, you know, again, I think um, some of these computer vision applications, new applications are gonna get spawned because we now have some of this metadata inside these environments, which I think is going to prove pretty interesting over time. Yes, I think so. Um, well, thank you very much. It looks like, unfortunately, we're just about out of time. Um, so to all the panelists, I want to thank you for the wonderful discussions today. I had a really good time and I think we learned a lot. Um, I think we have a few more uh, minutes for questions from the audience. So let's go ahead and move on to QA.